Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending Hyde Marine's webinar, Guide to Ballast Water Retrofits. This webinar marks the second of several webinars hosted by Hyde Marine. Please check our website periodically for the topics, date, and times of upcoming presentations. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box and direct them specifically to the host. After the presentation, we will try to address as many questions as possible. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our website. Please visit us at www.hydemarine.com or at our Facebook and LinkedIn pages for up-to-date ballast water information. Please note that this presentation contains historical information and forward-looking statements and includes Hyde Marine's interpretations of the landscape. Our speaker today is Mr. Mark Riggio, Product Manager at Hyde Marine. A graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, Mr. Riggio started his career as surveyor for ABS. He also worked for Crowley Maritime Corporation as a port engineer and later operated his own consulting company. As port engineer of the MV Cape Washington, Mr. Riggio helped design the first permanent shipboard ballast water testing facility as part of the Merck development team. At Hyde Marine, Mr. Riggio works very closely with all development efforts of our products and has very intimate involvement in the regulatory approval process. It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Riggio and pass the floor to him. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, again, as Adrian just stated, we'll start our webinar uh, overviewing the retrofit timeline. We have a lot of information to cover in the next 45 minutes or so, so we'll go ahead and get started. This morning, we'd like to share with you our general overview of the retrofit timeline, specifically identifying key milestones to help for a successful retrofit to provide you with some insight into some different options for doing your installation, some of the challenges that we've seen, and then finally walk you through a retrofit case study to help display and, and show to you some of the ways that we've been able to assist owners in the past. And hopefully you can take those lessons forward into your own fleets and move forward with retrofitting. So, why are we having this meeting? Obviously, there are a number of retrofit challenges that are coming ahead. The regulations are coming. They're on their way. There are 45,000 vessels, roughly, that during the next seven years, once the regulations are, in fact, signed into force, that will need to be retrofit for with ballast water treatment systems. Purely from a mathematic even standpoint, that means that there will be an average of 17.6 retrofit systems installed per day. Many of these systems will be installed during shipyard periods. That can have many benefits and also have some potential pitfalls because the extension of shipyard periods due to ballast water treatment system installation can mean a lot of additional costs. And it's important to understand that many shipyard scope items such as hull painting, sea valves, et cetera, will interfere with the installation of the ballast water treatment system. Finally, as we enter into the phase where the regulations are requiring the installation of systems, the pressure to meet regulatory requirements and regulatory timelines will likely limit choice and increased costs. So steps you can take today will help to save you money and ensure you sufficient supply of systems that you want in the future. I've drawn out here a base timeline for an installation. My best estimate for an installation is it takes between 45 and 56 weeks to complete an installation. For those vessels that are compliant or required to be compliant with the U.S. Coast Guard's final rule for ballast water treatment, some of you may already have retrofits that are due within the next year. And I'm telling you that if you haven't started already, it's time to get started. You may be a little behind the ball. We're going to walk through each of these individual steps, and I think you'll see that 45 weeks is actually a pretty optimistic number to get this done. It's probably a little more like 50, 52 to 56 weeks to get this done, meaning a little bit more than a year. All owners have to start with the basics, system selection. Now, this is an area where my timeline says it take about eight weeks. Many owners have been doing this for months or even years, looking at different types of technologies, 
looking at and trying to decide whether one technology will be best for their fleet or whether they like to optimize for individual vessels or individual services. This is the time when you can research multiple different suppliers, look at their experience, look at their approvals, look at their availability to deliver systems, and mostly look at what they've been able to accomplish over their period of time and how well you think they're going to be able to maintain themselves through the future beyond this ballast water retrofit situation. And finally, one, the next thing you want to look at is the life cycle operating costs. So this is the cost of the equipment that you purchase, cost of maintenance, and the cost of operation, as well as the interference to normal operations that ballast, your ballast water treatment system is likely to cause. Once you've, submit, once you've selected a system, then it's very important to start with pre-engineering. Now, pre-engineering is the most critical time for a successful retrofit. And what I mean by that is this is the time when you do all of the engineering work to make sure that the systems that you've selected will fit in the vessels that you've selected them to go with. Now, this can be done with in-house engineering resources, or it can be done with an outsourced engineering group but it's very critical to take a close look at every vessel that you plan to do an installation on and make sure that that vessel will be able to have the system that you want installed on it. There are two ways you can do this retrofit pre-engineering. One is a very traditional manual measuring techniques with an engineering team that goes out and does and looks at all the vessels and identifies areas of likely installation. This type of method and this type of retrofit usually involves a lot of field work and a lot of utilizing the, uh, the shipyard or the or riding crew to build the equipment on the ship. Now, this method greatly relies upon the experience of the individual engineers who are actually doing the surveys. And one thing that's, that people don't often think about in this is that it's very difficult to scale up when you have a fleet of 40, 50, 100, 200 ships to have good quality engineering teams that are able to go and address each individual ship. And so sometimes the quality of those individual surveys can be a little suspect. In order to combat that, there are a number of new techniques and technologies to be able to do your retrofit pre-engineering. One of those is laser scanning. And these have been very popular in the ballast water industry. Uh, laser scanning helps you to identify through a point cloud the location of every piece of equipment, every piece of structure, every cableway on a ship. This allows you to generate very, very precise engineering drawings, prefabricate your spot pipe spools, and hopefully be able to assemble on a very short time frame. It also helps to clearly identify interferences and key and critical joints during the fabrication process. This is an example of a laser scan project that we connected with our partners at Kofli. Uh, this was a, a, small, a small cargo vessel where they came in, were able to do a laser scan. Laser scan was shown on the previous screen as well. And then they were able to come in and very quickly complete the installation by having prefabricated all of the piping and a number of the, uh, the supporting structures and such. Once the pre-engineering has been completed, the next step, I recommend a ship visit. Now, during the pre-engineering phase, some people will attend the vessels and will actually go out to every vessel and, and do this. And so these, some of these phases may be able to be incorporated together. But predominantly, it's very important to go out to each individual ship and take a look at it and make sure that the engineering drawings that you have in the office match the actual vessel layout, and also get in touch with the crews and make sure that there's at least some buy-in from the crews, both on the type of system that you may select and where that system is going to be installed. Once the ship visit is complete, the next step is to purchase the system. Now, this may seem like a a strange, state, a strange place to have four weeks of time inputted because many people think of purchasing as just write a PO. But in reality, there's a lot of steps that are involved in the purchasing process. 
This is the great opportunity that owners have to negotiate purchase their price and delivery times and also look at whether or not they want to set up and negotiate a fleet contract whereby they can guarantee pricing or guarantee availability of systems throughout the retrofit process. Now during the purchase process, it's also important to set the installation and commissioning expectations of both parties to identify where the vessel is not only going to be during installation, but during delivery of the vessel and, during, and where the vessel will be during any pre-installation work and prefabrication work that needs to happen. Once the system has been purchased, then it's important to use your pre-engineering and your ship visits to now generate ship-specific engineering. Now, the timing of the ship-specific engineering is greatly affected by the amount of pre-engineering that's been done. And that's why there's a relatively long time frame on this, it's anywhere between two to six weeks. During the ship-specific engineering, you need to integrate the ballast water treatment system that you've selected, pre-engineered, and eventually purchased into the ship's drawings. And by that we mean we need to add it to the ballast system drawings, the electrical drawings, the electrical one lines, and make sure that all of your packages are ready to get together to be submitted to the class society. Now this also is the area where you can address the ship's, the ship's crew's specific concerns and issues because it's very important to understand that changes during a retrofit installation because a crew has decided that they want a system in a different place or they want it mounted a different way are much more costly and much more impactful to your final schedule than changes that are made during these engineering phases when you're doing your initial drawing developments. Now from a ship specific engineering standpoint, Here's another project that we did with Goltons, another one of our engineering partners. And this is a 3D cloud that we had done of a, another cargo vessel. And you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, there's a 3D model of, of the ship, which was used to generate a 3D model and eventually 3D isometric drawings in the lower right, in the lower left-hand corner, rather, of where the system is going to be installed and those 3D models then were used to generate the modifications to the piping drawing, which was later submitted to class. You'll see on the, on the far left-hand side of the screen. The red lines indicate drawings that we were changing, and these drawings were able to be submitted to class very easily, again, using the laser scan as a, as a starting point for the retrofit engineering phase. One of the most mysterious parts of this process is the submittal to the class society. Now this can take anywhere from six to 12 weeks and it may take much longer. It's important to understand, for everybody on the call to understand, that IMO type approval only guarantees a matter of efficacy, only says that a system will kill a certain number of organisms it does not mean that a system is suitable for installation on a specific type of ship. Class type approvals are intended to cover that. Every system that is installed, every retrofit system, must be inspected, must be, the drawings must be reviewed by class to make sure that these systems are suitable for installation aboard the specific ship that it's about to be installed on. In addition to this, there are some flag states particularly Liberia and the United States, that have their own particular approvals or require that to, do, to have a specific certificate or a specific approval done for systems to be installed on their vessels. And so it's very important to get these plans done early and get them submitted to class early because once they're submitted, the drawings then need to be reviewed and any comments need to be addressed. And the faster those can be addressed, the earlier in the engineering stages those can be addressed, the less impact that they're going to have on the installation in the future. It is also important to understand that as the retrofit bubble begins to grow 
and we're doing 17.6 installations per day. Class Society drawing reviews are widely regarded to be the most likely uh, the most likely part of this process that's going to be constrained, that's going to be a choke point. Uh, class societies are, are gearing up for these reviews and are becoming more and more aware of the need to do this quickly, but as many drawings and as many installation plans that can be done at this place, at this time, even before an installation is done, those can help streamline the process during the final retrofit phase when everybody else is submitting their drawings because they've done their work too late. It's also very important to understand because some owners are under the misconception that the, class, that the manufacturer of the ballast water treatment system can submit the drawings directly to the class society. And that's largely wrong because the manufacturer has capabilities to submit their own drawings on their own equipment. And many manufacturers receive independent class type approvals for their systems to streamline the class review process. But only the owners or the installation contractors have access to the interface points with the ship. And by that again, I mean the interface with the electrical switchboards, the one-line diagrams, and such, and also the structural modifications that are being done, the modifications to the ballast piping system and such. Only the owners of the ship or the installers have access to all of those drawings. And so largely that is an activity that must be done either by the vessel owner or by the installation subcontractor that the owner selects or that the manufacturer selects if the owner uh, tries to purchase a turnkey solution. Now, not indicated on the, on the diagram above is manufacturing. And largely because manufacturing can occur, the manufacturing of ballast water treatment systems can occur in conjunction with a lot of these other factors. And really, the only key part, part of manufacturing that the owners need to be aware of is that manufacturing will limit the amount of time that can extend between the purchase of a ballast water treatment system and its final delivery to the ship. Typically, these manufacturing times will vary based upon uh, both the contractor and the retrofit time scale. Current deliveries are probably in the 16 to 20 week category. Uh, some manufacturers may be able to cut that time down. I've chosen 16 weeks as a general figure. All manufacturers are going to be a little bit different as far as what the manufacturing times. As we get into the retrofit bubble again, there are many different components that may be choke points in this, uh, such as filters or other subcomponents, sensors, and such where multiple ballast water treatment systems utilize the same subcontractors. So it's important to understand all of the possible choke points and not just think of purely the treatment system being the singular choke point for this retrofit situation. And finally, in the manufacturing phase, it's important to remember that owners with fleet agreements can often arrange with a manufacturer to guarantee their deliveries over the course of a three, four, five year retrofit period instead of having to come on the spot market and purchase ballast water treatment systems for individual ships and have to deal with the potential of either price changes or availability changes or manufacturing lead time changes. Once manufacturing is complete, uh, it's then time for the equipment to be delivered to the vessel. Now, during the purchase process, we mentioned that it was important to set up an understanding of where the systems, both who would be responsible for and where the systems would be delivered to. And that's why we have kind of a broad time frame, two to eight weeks. It's going to depend largely upon whether systems are being ocean freighted or air freighted. Uh, many systems can be air freighted, but it is a fairly substantial cost adder. Many systems should be ocean freighted, but again, it takes a relative, relatively good amount of planning to be able to ocean freight a system. It's also important to try and coordinate the delivery of your equipment to where the vessel is going to be during the process. 
So for instance, if a ship is going into a shipyard in the Far East and the owner wants the system delivered in Europe, then the delivery time to the vessel may be very critical to make sure that the system meets the vessel in Europe before it transits to the Far East for a shipyard period. Somewhat coincidental to delivery, again, is prefabrication. Now, this is the time on the vessel or the time back in a shop or a time at a shipyard where a good engineering plan and a highly developed work scope can help increase the efficiency of the installation. And this is where you can build pipe spools, you can clear areas on the vessel, you can remove the ad hoc machine shop that a, the chief engineer set up in the space that you decided you would put your ballast water treatment system or relocate the oil drums that are there, uh, many other different possibilities. You can also prefabricate substructures, subflooring, pipe runs, pipe hangers, many different things that don't, don't need to be done once the, pipe, the system is actually installed, but can be done ahead of time. Manufacturers at this point can help step in. Uh, they, many manufacturers will have recommended installation partners who are very familiar with their systems and may be able to help understand what needs to be done in advance, how to run cable, what type of installations can be done. And those, you can choose to use those or use owner preference uh, installation partners as well. But either way, prefabrication is really one of the keys to a successful and efficient installation because the more work that can be done before the system arrives, the less possible interference points exist with installing the actual system. Our next phase, once we've completed our prefabrication and our system has been delivered to the ship, is installation. Installation can be completed any one of a number of different ways. Typically though, installation is either done in a shipyard in a, during the dry dock period, or installation is done underway. Uh, and underway may mean just sitting alongside the vessel in a layup period, not necessarily actually running, uh, but also systems can be installed if you do enough pre-engineering and prefabrication or have good plans. Systems can be installed while a vessel is operating with absolutely no downtime to the vessel. Now, if you select to do different ways, there's going to be different benefits and different risks associated with that. But really, the key to installation is the steps that have happened before. Pre-engineering, the ship visit, engineering for the ship, and prefabrication. Corners that have been cut in those previous steps will manifest themselves quickly during the installation phase and will extend your installation period. So the question that many ship owners are asking themselves is, should I install in service or should I install during a dry dock? Installations in service do have significant benefits. Most importantly, there's absolutely no off-hire or downtime to the vessel. There's also the, key, the other key benefit that many people don't consider is that for vessels whose compliance date are tied to a dry dock period, if the vessel is not, if the system is not installed at the dry dock smoothly and there are some issues, there's some lingering problems or some lingering work that needs to be done, the ship will be non-compliant as soon as it leaves the dry dock. Now, when IMO ret uh, retracted their timeline to match the MARPOL certificate, that alleviated this risk for a number of, of different ship owners. But the U.S. Coast Guard final rule still ties this date to a dry dock. And so for vessels that are coming directly to the U.S. or dry docking in the U.S., um, that could be a significant concern. And also for vessels who complete all of their surveys at one time so that they go to a dry dock and then complete their MARPOL survey at the same time, 
they may be constrained and unable to move ballast when they're trying to leave the shipyard. Now, the risks with an in-service installation are that the project time can take a lot longer than the seven days that the seven to fourteen days that a that a shipyard installation could take. Logistics can be very challenging, especially once a ship leaves a pier. If you don't have all the materials that you need, it's very difficult to go to a supply house and get more pipe or get more welding rods. And the other thing is that there may be a significant restriction to access to the ballast water system while underway. And finally, there may be additional costs that are associated with this, such as lost cabin revenue for cruise ships or changes in your loading and ballasting rates that come as a result of this work that's going on during the, during the vessel's operations. Here's an example of an in-service installation that we did. Uh, this was completely done while the vessel was operating, no downtime to the vessel, no work was done in port due to hot work restrictions in all of the ports that this vessel, particular vessel visited, and that also is fairly common. And you can see that the end product is a very high quality product. You'd never be able to tell that this was installed uh, while the vessel was operating, again, with no extension to a dry dock period at, at any time. Speaking of dry docks, if you choose to install in a dry dock, you also have a number of advantages. Primarily, with the vessel being out of the water and in a shipyard, you have easy access to manpower, supplies, and materials to ensure that your installation can be very smooth and that you won't run out of something two-thirds of the way through an install. You also have heavy lift capabilities to be able to get equipment on and off the ship. And most importantly, especially for larger vessels, access to the machinery spaces or the pump rooms to make the install is certainly much more conducive and probably only possible through access cuts in the hull which are impossible to do while a vessel is operating. Now, the risks are that installation during a shipyard is likely to be to cause interferences with your other shipyard work. For instance, hull painting that may be severely impacted by your ballast water treatment system installation. And as we mentioned before, Delays in this installation can extend your time on dock and your time in the shipyard. And shipyard costs tend to be relatively high, especially for extra lay days or extra days on dock. So these are significant costs that need to be considered when doing a shipyard installation. This is an example of a shipyard retrofit that was done. Uh, even in a shipyard retrofit though, pre-engineering and prefabrication are important. You see from these pictures, or what's not necessarily super clear in these pictures was a lot of work was done, uh, prefabrication work was done on fabricating these copper nickel pipes to be able to install the system very quickly once it got into the shipyard. Also during the installation, you need to be very aware of possible innovative solutions that you need to come up with. There are a number of different scenarios that we've run into in the past where a traditional installation in the machinery spaces, which would have been preferable, just wasn't possible. Uh, one of those installations is vessels with Framo deep well pumps. Uh, there is no pump room, and they have hazardous requirements, and so the systems must be installed in a deck house on the deck. Uh, we've also had very good success using innovative piping materials and methods particularly innovative piping methods where hot work is not allowed on the vessel uh, during port stays. Now the last step in the retrofit process is commissioning. And I say three days here, but uh, I think for many, of, for many of us and many of my competitors, three days is a, is a good goal. Um, now this Commissioning is typically done by manufacturers or a certified agent, and it includes the time for crew training and operational familiarization, as well as for class acceptance. Depending on the installation, 
And depending on how the system at prefabrication and fabrication and actual installation work goes, commissioning can be very smooth or commissioning can take a long time. We've had some great success in getting commissionings done in one or two days, and some commissionings take more, a lot more than that. Very complex installations, hazardous area installations on tankers will take a few more than three days. But all of this needs to be factored in when you're looking at that and needs to be addressed during this purchase process so that you're not at the end of a shipyard period expecting that commissioning will take 24 hours and in reality it takes two or three or four days. Now caution, it's important to understand. Earlier I said 45 weeks, but 45 weeks is very optimistic. There are a lot of places and a lot of chances in this process for delays. Particularly as you get deeper and deeper into the retrofit cycle when supply becomes more constricted. Experience is the key in selecting your partners to avoid those challenges. Shipyard availability is likely when we get two or three years from now, we'll have very limited room for slippage. So there'll be the next ship ready to come in. There always is. And so early work and pre-planning pays late dividends. Again, how do you reduce this timeline? One of the keys that we've seen in successful retrofits is to establish a fleet-wide project team with experience in capital projects. Identify a project manager, identify key resources, bring crew members in, and bring your installation contractors in, and focus on a constant holistic solution and create plans and stick with those plans. And then once you're done with projects, create a lessons learned and feed that back to the core group so that they can make sure that they don't repeat the same mistakes as they go forward within the fleet. Don't wait until your compliance date to start this process. If you do, you're going to face issues getting it done, and you're going to face mostly costs associated with that. I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to walk through a quick retrofit case study. Uh, in the interest of time, there are a, a number of case studies we could have walked through and a number of retrofits that I could walk through. Once this slide deck is posted on our website, there are a number of other retrofit images and some, other, some more case studies attached to the back of the presentation, but I'm not going to walk through each one of those today, again, uh, just in the interest of time and to make sure that we have enough time to answer any questions that come up. So I'm going to walk through a, a case study of retrofits that starts back in 2003. Uh, back in 2003, Hyde did their first retrofit of a ballast water treatment system of our Hyde Guardian. Uh, this, the installation was done and was carried out by an owner contractor, an owner selected contractor, and it was supervised by Hyde Marine. Uh, being our first installation, it took about 60 days, a little more than 60 days to install the system, make all the necessary modifications, and have the system commissioned and accepted by class. Fast forward a few years to 2006. In 2006, we did another case, we did another in retrofit install installation uh, for the same managing company. And this was installed 100% during normal cruise schedules. Um, it took about 42 days from the start of installation to commissioning. And once all the fabrication work was done, most of the installation mechanical work was actually done by the crew in just about four days. Um, the crew then commissioned the system with the assistance of Hyde, and with Hyde Marine, they accept, the system was accepted by class. A comment from the crew was that the system was a piece of cake to get installed, and, uh, and it was a piece of cake to run. Again, fast forward. Um, same operating company, 2011. Uh, we're now, I believe this was our fifth or sixth system that we installed with this company. Uh, this also was installed by the same 
owner preferred contractor during the normal vessel schedule, so during normal cruising, supervised by Hyde Marine, and by incorporating lessons learned, even though this installation required a fabrication of an entire platform and repiping of the ballast system, we were able to complete the installation in just 21 days from start to finish. So from the start of arrival on board until final commissioning by Lloyd's, it was done in just 21 days. Again, uh, now in 2013, the end of 2013, we've completed our 10th installation for this same owner, uh, the same managing company. And uh, this also was another underway retrofit. So this was a, a different selected third-party contractor, installation supervised by Hyde, and this was about 25 days. I had a couple of different variations. You can see it also had a platform that was built, had a, a few piping modifications that needed to be made. And what was fairly unique about this project was that the owner selected to use a plastic piping um, for the, the key piping connections on this system as well, and that was accepted by class. And it helped to ease their installation time because they were able to work around hot work issues in port. Um, there were some logistics issues with the pipe that actually made the commissioning time, though, or made the installation time be roughly the same as it was with the steel pipe. And we continue to work with this contract, with this, uh, this owner today. In order to get the timeline from 60 days down to a roughly 20 to 25 days, we needed to apply a lot of lessons. And this lesson application is really what's going to help you as an owner be able to move forward effectively and efficiently with your ballast water system retrofits. First thing that we've learned is that the ship visit is critical to identify the best available location for each ballast water treatment system component. And it's important when you're on the ship to have crew involvement because we've had numerous installation, pos numerous installation cases where we've arrived on a, a vessel to help do an installation and the crew wants to move it to a different location. And that immediately puts in a significant time increase into a project. We've also found that experienced partnerships cut down the installation times and significantly cut down rework. Many systems, after they're installed, need some rework because installation of a ballast water treatment system is not something that most contractors do every day. And so having somebody who's used to installing your system, having trained and certified installation partners, really cuts down on the rework and the install time for your ballast water treatment system. And finally, planning for all of the operational modes of the vessel really affects the installation plans. And particular, of particular concern here is gravity ballasting and gravity deep ballasting because most vessels utilize gravity ballast and gravity deep ballast for some phases of operation, and yet many systems are not installed in such a way to allow for a, an efficient water path through the treatment system during gravity or gravity ballasting or gravity deballasting. And so if the vessel wants to do some of these functions, as well as stripping and using an inductor, using positive displacement pumps, many different aspects of vessel operation should be considered when you're looking at where the system is going to be installed. Remember that the test is coming. The U.S. regulations are in force Compliance dates are coming into force, and ship owners now face hard compliance deadlines. Some owners have gained some experience, but really there are many questions that still remain. There are questions about flag and class requirements. There are, flag, there are questions about port state compliance and inspection requirements. There are a lot of questions in the press right now about equipment performance and reliability. There are a lot of questions about installation and the capabilities of these installation partners. And for any of you that will be in London for the uh, tele a conference next week, I'll be giving a presentation on how installations affect equipment performance and reliability 
and how that is a key factor in the long-term health and operations of ballast water treatment systems. But the reality is that there is really limited real retrofit experience, both in the engineering and in the installation sectors, particularly for large capacity, multi-trained systems, particularly for large vessels, large bulk carriers, large tankers. The experience that most companies have is relating to new construction vessels, not retrofits. And so it's important to select partners that have the most experience possible, but understand that you're still going to need to do a lot of work to make sure that everything works perfectly. What you can do right now is develop and refine the retrofit process for your companies and develop your engineering toolbox to effectively and efficiently handle the upcoming retrofit demands. You need to realize that the traditional tape measure engineering and in-place design probably won't work for ballast water treatment, even though that's going to mean additional costs for doing highly engineered drawings and potentially laser scans. But those will save you time over the course of your install. And finally, in this time, you should gain as much experience as possible before your compliance date is enforced. Systems that are installed now before the dry dock date have the capability of being modified, looked at, repaired, installed, and adapted to your vessel much more easily than a system that's installed in a dry dock when you have to treat in order to move your first piece of cargo coming out of the dock. With that, I would ask if there are any questions. Thanks, Mark. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to direct them to the host in the Q&A box. Um, our first question is, um, what was your latest producing capacity in units per year? Production capacity at, at Hyde Marine um, is somewhere in the neighborhood of two, 200 to 250 units per year uh, capacity with our current facility. Um, our capacity right now is not constrained, and we have plans to grow with the retrofit market to meet all of our stated, all of our corporate goals for growth. Uh, at this point in time, the retrofit market, and particularly the entire ballast water treatment market, has been slow to develop, and so we're waiting for indications that the market is developing at an appropriate and healthy pace to warrant investment into expanding our capability, but right now our capability, our manufacturing capability is perfectly acceptable for what we have for the order book that we have right now. Um, do you, Hyde Marine, have U.S. Coast Guard approval? Uh, Hyde Marine has uh, U.S. Coast Guard AMS approval. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard has not issued type approval for any system at, at this date. Uh, at this point in time, there are two independent labs that exist, the NSF lab and the DNV uh, lab, I, independent lab group. Uh, Hyde Marine has contracted with DNV to conduct our testing, and Hyde Marine expects to test soon for U.S. Coast Guard type approval. Uh, and it, but at this time, there are no there are no companies with U.S. Coast Guard final type approval, and Hyde Marine was in the first one of the first companies with the AMS certification, and remains a strong partner with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, to achieve their requirements. For the equipment installed in service, what was the maximum capacity that was installed? The maximum capacity single train or single system we've installed was a 2,500 cubic meter per hour system. Um, it was sold. There were two systems sold to a, to ships, so total capacity of the ship was 5,000 cubic meters per hour. Um, there was an additional system. Those, that particular vessel was a, an oil tanker, 
And so we additionally, for those ships, sold a, an aft peak tank system uh, to treat the water that was not hazardous. But uh, the largest system, single systems we've sold is, is 2,500 cubic meters per hour per ballast pump. Does ballast water require to be passed one time or two times, i.e. during ballasting and deballasting? If two times, how do we manage on large bulk carriers, which require dropping topside tanks very quickly for fast loading by dropping them by opening a valve on deck? That's really an excellent question, and it's a question that we get uh, significantly, and I'll, I'll take a moment on that. Ballast water treatment systems break down largely into two camps. One camp believes that you can treat all, provide all treatment on uptake, ballasting, and you don't need any treatment on deballasting. Other treatment systems believe, like Hyde Marine, believe that you must treat both on ballast and deballast. And I'm not going to speak too much to the single pass, but I will speak to why Hyde Marine feels that it's very important to treat on intake and discharge. And that is that the ballast water treatment standard is not a zero discharge standard. It is a very, very high reduction standard uh, from 100,000 organisms greater than 50 micron down to less than 10. The only inherent problem is, is that that less than 10 over the course of time can multiply. And so unless the water is completely sterilized, those organisms will reproduce. Now for some vessels, particularly for the topside tanks on a bulk carrier, that voyage may be relatively short. Let's say it's four or five days. After four or five days, the organisms may not have had a chance to, to uh, reproduce that much, so that you're probably still don't have that many organisms. But if you're taking on a cape-sized bulk carrier and you're taking a trip around the, one of the capes, that voyage could easily be 20 to 30 days. And in 20 to 30 days, those organisms are reproducing in the ballast tank. And then when you discharge, because remember, this is the ballast water treatment standard is a discharge standard. So all treatment is going to be, all sampling is going to take place during discharge. If the, even if those 10 organisms, or let's say you have eight organisms, and only half of them reproduce and you get to 12, then you are non-compliant with the standard. And over the course of lifespan of those organisms, they'll likely reproduce a few times during that 30-day voyage around the Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn. And so Hyde Marine feels very strongly that it's important to protect the owners of the vessel by treating both on uptake and on discharge to make sure that when you are sampled that you have the greatest possible chance of passing the test because the organisms will have just been treated and will be reduced well back down below the IMO threshold. Now for the topside bulk tanks, that is a known issue, and it's a very difficult issue. And I will defer to my friend Ron Everett at a conference with the U.S. Coast Guard who stated, to, who stated to the group, he said that most people think that ballast water treatment will be able to treat ballast and ships will continue to operate the same way they always have. And with ballast water treatment, the process of ballasting has fundamentally changed. And so these are things that you have to work out with your flag administration and can be addressed in the ballast water management plan as far as how to deal with, again, topside bulk, you know, the, the, the topside ballast tanks in a bulk carrier, the slope tanks. But this needs to be addressed specifically with your flag administration, and you need to be able to address how even on a a treatment system that utilizes a single pass with a, a chemical or such, uh, you need to be able to address how you're going to deal with the disinfection byproducts and any neutralization that needs to happen before that water is discharged back into a, the receiving water body at your port of call. How is aft peak to be treated, which does not pass through the main ballast pump, but passes through the smaller pump? 
general service pump? So typically the aft peak tanks on many ships are serviced by a, a much smaller pump. And so at Hyde Marine, we have a couple of different pos ways that we've addressed that in the past. And, and I apologize, I don't know how many of my competitors do this, uh, but I'll just state how we have done it. In some cases, for a, for a vessel such as an oil tanker, where there's a hazardous boundary and the water from forward of the pump room cannot go back into the engine room, we have the ship install a secondary system. Many ships make a mistake here, and they will tie the ballast of the aft peak tank to, a, let's say, a fire pump or a general service pump that runs at a fairly high rate, let's say 450 cubic meters per hour. And that tank will discharge the aft peak in 30 minutes. And so because the pump is rated so high, the manufacturer, the manufactured system needs to be rated for that higher flow rate, 400, say 450 cubic meters per hour. We have suggested to owners that they install a secondary pump, a smaller pump, say 60 or 100 cubic meters per hour for the aft peak tank, because those tanks typically are not ballasted and deballasted that often. And so if they can stand to, instead of deballast in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, instead of deballast the aft peak or ballast the aft peak in two hours, they can purchase a much smaller ballast water treatment system to serve that tank. And the cost of the ballast water, the cost savings on buying a much smaller ballast water treatment system plus a very small pump is much less than what the cost of a larger system would have cost. And then you also don't have as much power draw and such. And so we generally recommend that owners consider a unique aft peak tank ballast pump that is, that is used to discharge that tank or fill that tank on the very rare occasions when the aft peak is, is actually used. The other way that we can do that is to tie that general service pump directly with the ballast main and put that through a normal ballast treatment system. Now that assumes that the water from forward of the engine room bulkhead is non-hazardous and therefore can be treated by a normal system or rather that the aft peak tank and all of the other ballast tanks can be treated by the same ballast water treatment system. And that's possible as well but putting a system that has a very low flow through a large flow system can have some impacts, particularly if there's problems keeping the pipe full in the ballast water treatment system. In comparing with other um, manufacturers, why does Hyde apply high voltage cable instead of a normal 440 volt cable? Is there a special reason? The I get, I'm not completely certain of the question. Um, Hyde Marine utilizes a specific cable um, that we've used for some time now that's marine rated uh, with any UV system, with any, actually with any power source, the IEC or IEEE or, or other international standards set certain barriers for cable diameter. And that's based upon both the volts and the, uh, the wattage of the, of the cable. Um, the 440 volt is a power source that's brought into the system, but that is not the KV, that's not the voltage that's actually submitted out to the lamps, that's not, that's not brought out to the lamps. Uh, UV lamps typically run at a much higher, especially medium pressure UV lamps run at a higher uh, voltage than that typically right around a thousand volts. And so the cables that we use have to not only be certified for the power that's used in the lamp, but also what's called the strike voltage. So that when the lamp strikes, for the moment that the lamp strikes, the voltage in the lamp can increase by up to about 25%. So upwards of about 12 to almost 1300 volts. And so I know Hyde uses a 1300 volt 
marine rated cable for our lamp wires in order to meet class requirements. Uh, if we did not use that cable, we would have problems and our owners would have problems with class approvals of our systems. And that's, again, likely going to be a scenario that many treatment systems have to deal with. Uh, and if they're not, that may be an area where a ship owner needs to be very cautious of where there can be potential pitfalls in the class review process. How will the U.S. Coast Guard look at UV technology for ballast water treatment since it does not kill the organism, instead it changes the DNA? That's another very good question and, and brings us to what we talked about in our last webinar, which was the U.S. Coast Guard UV issue. Uh, the short answer to that question is that we have been working well with the Coast Guard for the last two years to address this issue. Uh, it is well known is a well known issue, and it is an area where the U.S. Coast Guard is different than the rest of the world. We have participated in a couple of different processes, most recently and and, and strongly with the EPA's uh, Equipment Technology Verification Program (ETV), and that ETV group is validating a method called the most probable number method, MPN, which is a grow-out assay, which identifies um, areas that, that, or which identifies the growth potential of organisms. But more so than that, I think it's important to understand that Hyde Marine has been working very closely with the testing community, and by that I mean um, people that are developing compliance testing equipment. Um, and there are a number of technologies that are available, technologies using something called ATP, uh, technologies using PAM fluorescence, uh, technologies such as uh, the Speedy Bree, uh, many other different things that are very capable of identifying growth potential right now. And so we believe that this is a, a very temporary issue and that this will be resolved shortly and it will not be an issue going forward. The U.S. Coast Guard has been very strong in saying that UV systems are not excluded and that they will consider UV systems. And the EPA has been very strong in stating that AMS-approved systems are fully compliant with their vessel general permit, which means that they fully accept uh, UV systems in the United States. This is, again, simply a, a matter of closing this matter out, uh, but it will be addressed and it will not be an issue going forward. 